Welcome to the Animal Training Fundamentals Podcast, where we have fun with practical application and we get mental with the science of behavior. Put them both together and you get results. Solutions for your behavior problems and the tools you need to achieve your training goals. I'm your host, Barbara Heidenreich. Let's talk training. Hey guys, welcome to a new episode of the Animal Training Fundamentals podcast with Barbara Heidenreich. And I'm really excited about my special guest, Kelly Snyder. She is the gal who brought us CAT, Constructional Aggression Treatment, or sometimes called the Constructional Approach or Constructional Aversion Treatment. It's got lots of different names these days. But you know what? It's all about changing behavior using non-coercive methods of giving animals distance from things that maybe they don't like so much. And I know you guys have heard me talk a lot about this procedure because I spent, wow, I guess maybe the last two years before the pandemic, really applying this procedure with exotic animals. And I've done a lot of presentations on this procedure in the last year or so because I'm in love with it. It is such a valuable procedure. And I really would love for people to embrace this because it's going to make such a difference in so many animals' lives. And so I'm really thrilled to talk to Kelly Snyder, who really brought this procedure to our community. So let's get into this podcast so you can learn all about how it all started and why this procedure is so important to you and the animals whose lives you're trying to improve. So let's get into it. Yay. I am so excited. It's Barbara Heidenreich. I'm here doing another podcast with a special guest. We have Kelly Snyder. She is the originator of one of my favorite procedures, CAT. Yay. Sometimes known as the constructional approach. Welcome, Kelly Snyder. Hi, Barbara. So good to see you or hear you after all these years. I know. We don't get to see each other that much. (laughs) All right. So I'm, I'm, I've been thinking about this for a long time because it's really been a while now that Kat's been around. And the thing that came to my mind is how the heck did you come up with this idea? What inspired you to do this? Well, I won't take all the credit, but I can tell you kind of a history of how it came along. Um, Eddie Fernandez, the animal guy, um, he was a student of Jesus Rosales, and um, they started the orca program, and I believe their first animal, or one of their first animals, was an aggressive goat in a petting zoo, (laughs) which needed some work, so um, they had been talking with Alexandra Curlin, the horse lady, had the conversation and started experimenting with some things like delivering food and walking away and they were having really good luck with it and then I I got in with a group that was doing the same thing with llamas and then um when I was in graduate school Jesus goes um who'd like to do this negative reinforcement procedure with dogs and I'm like with aggression and I'm like I will, because I'm an idiot. Nobody else in the room wanted to do it. So I got to like commit myself to working with mean dogs for forever. Um, but then I was basically just taking one dog out when, and figuring out how to set up the environment and um, walking away when they're behaving a little better. And, you know, um, we didn't use the food component. Um, we just used the walking away and I, it was just like one success after another. Um, so I just, I like slammed them out for my thesis and, um, um, I guess the rest is history. It just kept going from there. And I, and I did kind of jump the gun because, you know, I'm just assuming everybody knows what cat is or what the constructional approach is. Maybe I should mm-hmm. let you explain a little bit. I'm just so in love with the procedure that, you know, I just think everybody knows what it is. So maybe you can, you know, kind of summarize a little bit what, what the constructional approach is or cat and what the acronym stands for. Okay, sure. Um, the constructional aggression treatment is, um, 
based on some work that was done by Dr. Israel Gold Diamond back in the 1970s. Um, of course, it's still being done. Um, but the key is instead of um, eliminating problem behavior, we we reinforce desirable behavior um, that it, and we reinforce it strongly enough that it takes the place of the former behavior. So like with an aggressive dog, they've learned that barking and growling and lunging and all that will get other people and animals to go away. So they're working for that distance between themselves and something else. And um, so we just provide that for them, but only when they do something that's preferred or safer than the aggressive behavior they're performing. So um, it's a shaping procedure. So you're gonna be, um, they're not gonna offer you this perfect behavior right up front, but you do think all the things that you would do in, um, a desensitization procedure in terms of setting things up. You stay below threshold. You do things to keep the animal in their thinking mind so that they're not too stressed to learn. Um, and then you pay attention to their whatever behaviors they're offering. And if it's like, she's not growling she didn't do much else but she's not growling i'm gonna walk away when she did that but then i'm gradually gonna expect or, or start waiting for more and more and more um preferred behaviors until she's just automatically offering these better behaviors and not even trying with the other behaviors yeah Did that make sense yeah yeah and because um you know, one of the things that I've really learned from, from you all and, and your work is to apply this with exotic animals. And, and so um, it's been, and it's been really wonderful for, for me, because I certainly, you know, encounter animals that might show aggressive behavior, and it also works really well with fear responses too. Um, and so sometimes I can get great success in just well, I should say a lot of times I get great success in just one training session. And you're right, you start, you know, really far away so that your animal has the opportunity to present a response that you can reinforce. So really, you know, right. barely get any re reaction from the animal, like if, if I'm the aversive stimulus. So I'm so far away, the animal's kind of like, oh, I noticed you over there, but you know what, I don't really care that much. So I'm just going to look away or or I'm going to scratch myself, or I'm going to, you know, put my head down. And I'm like, oh, that's a behavior I can reinforce by going away. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, um, and why is this such a great procedure compared to, say, you know, trying to give the animal something you may think it might desire, like a, like a treat or something like that? Well, you know, there's nothing per se wrong with using treats. Um, but the key here is that we're doing a functional procedure. So what we do is we look at the animal. The animals, I, I have worked mostly with dogs. I've worked with a lot of species, but mostly with dogs. So um, we look at their collection of... Um, aggressive behaviors and the environment they developed in. So I like to talk about the difference between classical and operant behavior when I talk about this. Um, when uh, in, in the dog world, people tend to believe that, and they've been taught that um, emotional behavior is always respondent classical behavior. So it's always just stimulus response. And that can be true for a little while. So the first time a dog gets startled by a man coming around the corner and he barks and growls, I'll give them, you know, a slide on that because it's, it's probably he got startled and he barked and that's a dog thing to do when he got startled. But if this has happened over and over and over again, like I'm working on a 
um, on a webinar with Lauren Novak, who lives in New York City. So the clients we'll be working with are dogs that get taken out into a pretty overwhelming situation every day. Um, so they've had a lot of chances to do this, to practice, so to speak. And what happens is it stops being that respondent, uh, classical response, and it starts being learned as soon as the behavior hits the environment um, and gets some sort of consequence. So if the dog looks up and sees a man coming around the corner, it startles the dog. First time, it's probably stimulus response. He didn't have to learn how to do that. But the second time and all the other times after that, he knows that there's a potential response, a potential consequence that he values. Um, and it seems to be attached to when he barks and lunges. So the man comes around the corner, he barks and lunges, the man goes away. And if that keeps happening, that's just reinforcement. That's just reinforcement. So that behavior goes from that moment of being um, um, reflexive stimulus response to being operant behavior. And at that point, um, at that point, it's reinforced by the distance between the dog and the person. So when we take a treat, I am going to finally get back to the point of your question. Um, when we give a treat to a dog in that situation, it's irrelevant to him. The treat is like some other thing that I have to deal with right now. Maybe he loves treats. Maybe he will eat treats right now in the middle of his high stress. Um, maybe he will eat the, the treat just to get your hand out of his face. Um, <laughs> it, he, he, maybe he'll completely ignore the treat or spit it out, but the treat isn't relevant. What's relevant is that he did something and that other thing moved away, gave him distance, made him feel safer. And so if we just focus on what he's telling us that he needs to feel safe, then we're going to make a lot more progress a lot more quickly. And I love um, something you and I were talking about before we started recording is that we are giving the animal what he really wants. And what he really wants is for that person to go away. And so, you know, when we talk about training with reinforcement, which is what most of us want to do, then, you know, we really are truly being good reinforcement trainers when, when we use this procedure. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting um, area of conversation because we were taught, I was taught, and I think most of my positive reinforcement trainer friends were taught years ago um, and, and up until today that you know, there's, there's four quadrants and extinction and that's all there is. Um, but I would wager that, I mean, you know, I would posit that um, there aren't, those four quadrants are not what we think they are. And what we really should be looking at is not whether it's positive reinforcement versus negative reinforcement, but what's, when we're dealing with problem behaviors. We need to look at what is already reinforcing that behavior in the environment. If, and this does happen, not, it's not a huge problem usually, but it has worked up to be the problem in some cases. If we've got a family that, for example, plays roughly with the dog and the dog begins um, producing aggressive behaviors because that's how he knows to get social interaction, that's positively reinforced aggression. So you can reinforce aggression positively. Um, and as we were talking about a little bit earlier, um, you can, um, slap a choke chain on a dog and yank his neck and use negative reinforcement in a really bad way. So you can use positive reinforcement to create behavior problems. You can use negative reinforcement to create behavior problems, but we're not into any of that. Our whole goal is 
how can we best achieve, um, how can we best help the animal learn behaviors that are going to help it get along in the world it has to live in? So like whether that's a house, a zoo, um, or whatever, the world that it lives in, it has to behave in certain ways to be successful. If I try to convince, um, let me say it a little differently. So if I've got a dog that I need to behave better and I give him treats when he does something, like when he looks at me or whatever I'm working, you know, whatever I'm training, uh, give him a click and a treat and he takes the treat and he's learning to look at me. So that little bit of reinforcement is going on, but he's not learning to deal with this aversive stimulus in the environment. And I want to finish up with an animal that can look over there, see the aversive stimulus, whether it's a trainer, a handler, a person, you know, a vet or whatever. I want them to be able to there and to look over there and not be freaked out by what they see. Um, and I also don't want them to think, well, every time something goes bad, I get food because I really want it to be relevant. I want it to be relevant for them. Um, and it, it just, we do use food in cat. I, that's a question that comes up a lot. You know, why don't you use food? Well, we actually do use it. We just don't use it as part of the reinforcement process for ch behavior change. But when we do use it is, and this isn't required, but it can be helpful, is just to see how comfortable the animal is with the procedure. Like if we've been working for a while, we wanna make sure we haven't been pushing the animal over threshold. Um, we'll kind of take a little break. We'll go off to the side, do some tricks um, and kind of just see what's the attitude he takes the treat with. Is he like just gobbling it down or is he like eating it? It's looking for more, you know, like are we seeing, um, are we seeing happy, happy behaviors or are we seeing like just get out of my face kind of behaviors? Like I want to be near you because this whole situation freaks me out and I'll eat the treat just because you're cramming it in my face. So um, as far as working on the aggression, though, he's already told us that what he wants is distance or he wants the other the aversive stimulus to stop doing something so that he can chill out enough to not be constantly on guard. Yeah, and I've used the eating behavior too, like like how you described, like the visual I have is when working with this wildebeest that it would, it would, if it was calm enough to eat its hay, that was sort of our indicator, okay, we can approach a little bit and then it would alert and it would say, I see you. And that was our indicator, okay, we need to stop moving forward and then, we would use the eating behavior as, okay, he's relaxed now. That's our, our indicator behavior that we're going to remove ourselves. And so we would use that as a quote behavior, not as, oh, that's reinforcing uh, the person being nearby. That was actually our behavior to move away. Um, so we, we would use it. Yeah. That, um, yeah. One of the that, that, that is a hard thing to get your head wrapped around when you've been a positive reinforcement trainer for your whole career or for years it's hard to train yourself to not give, but to go, <laughs> it's I like, agree. And it, but it's opposite. <laughs> it's so weird. Cause you're, you, you have this little mechanical treat offering stuff that you do. And then it's like, no, we're not even going to do that. We're just going to walk away. And it, it feels like you're cheating the animal, but you're not, you're giving them what they want. And that is the key. I agree. One of the things I wanted to mention when you were talking about the respondent behavior, I think one of the things that we do when we're applying this procedure is we actually change the characteristic of the aversive stimulus. We, we transition from an aversive to an appetitive, um, or we can, because we start by giving that animal distance. And then as you're saying, one of the things we can do is when we get to that place where the animal is showing relaxed and comfortable behavior in the presence of that stimulus, we can, as you mentioned, we can start pairing an appetitive with that stimulus. And, uh, and I see that the animal, you know, you might get the animal approaching, 
that stimulus and you might get engagement with it. And suddenly now that what thing that was aversive is now an appetitive. And that includes humans. Um, the human, you know, with dogs, a lot of times it's either a dog or a human that the dog is aggressive toward. Um, so by the end, if I have time to work all the way through from beginning to end with an animal, by the end, I'm no longer an aversive stimulus. If I'm the helper person, I'm no longer an aversive stimulus. They're like, you're interesting. They start showing me some um, affiliative behavior, sniffing toward me, moving toward me. When I'm feeling safe enough, I'll let them sniff my jeans or whatever. And um, they start, they will start love coming up and soliciting attention at a certain point you have to be really careful in that phase because if, if they're not if you push it and they're not quite there yet you could have a really big setback or a bite or something but um i've never been bitten in the course of a cat of cat work and it's just because you're you're paying so much good attention and you're really responding to what the animal is trying to tell you with their body that they may have been trying to tell you all their lives in the case of dogs is um you know i'm concerned and I, it's like i want to say i respect that you're concerned and i want you to understand that i i get it and i want you to know that i'm not going to push you farther than you need to be pushed and going back to that you know and this ties into what you're saying about getting accustomed to the mechanics of it all because again we are talking about the practical application part here and the skill I too found that it, it takes a lot of practice. It's not, you know, it's not a beginner thing. You just go in there and go, okay, I'm going to do it now. Um, yeah. It's the, like, you're saying that getting used to, oh, my timing and wait, I have to remove instead of go forward where my, my instinct in the past would have been, okay, now I move forward, but no, 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 I need to back off. It takes some practice. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, when you do that, when you just like, you're, you make yourself go through this process of thinking, I mean, you're still giving them something. You're not physically giving them something, but you're, you're giving them what they want. So it's like, okay, what does he want? Turn away. And um, uh, it's just different, but it expands your horizon as a trainer because you're like, okay, I have lived in this little paradigm of, um, giving treats or praise or toys or giving things that almost exclusively include a, an element of social interaction. And here I am working with a dog or an animal for whom social interaction is the exact thing he does not want from you at this moment. Um, and you've got to learn that there's a lot of ways to give love <laughs> and sometimes it's to go away. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, for me in my world, there's a lot of animals that don't want love. You know, I think yeah. of like a herd of antelope or like, uh, yeah, I don't need you to come in. Yeah, yeah. Me. So fortunately they, you know, they teach you that <laughs> quite easily. Um, <laughs> So that's, that's been a good, good lesson, but I, but, you know, so I have to tell you the story of how I came to really embrace this because I think I was like many people out there who was hesitant and resistant. And so I want people to hear that story because I know there are still many of you out there <laughs> and we need to have, I do too. And it's okay. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> we need to have this discussion. We need to have this discussion. So <clears throat> I think I was like a lot of people who had been, you know, really um, told that, you know, counter conditioning was the way to go. And I want to say that there is absolutely a place for counter conditioning in our world. I don't I want agree. to think that, that that's not an important tool. It is. There are definitely circumstances when that is the tool we need. Um, but there is also a place for this procedure. And what sold me was I remember having you know, a conversation with Jesus, similar to what you were describing here, where he was describing that animal that, that you were explaining that saying, you know, I want, I want that cookie, but I'm having to fight through this fear response or aggressive behavior to take your cookie. And that's not really, you know, the, that's not the stimulus picture I want. I don't want an animal who's 
looking, you know, fearful or aggressive and trying to take the food. We never want that picture. We want the animal calm and relaxed and accepting that, that item that you have to offer. And that really stuck with me. And I, I really thought, yeah, you know, he, that's, that's right. So I think that's what got me willing to try it. And, um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate in that when I'm out there working, you know, I can, I can experiment with that. And so I, I started, uh, you know, trying it out when I had opportunities and, and sort of the big red flag for me is when I am working with an animal and, and I, and I just, you know, and, and the animal shows me a fear response or aggressive behavior in response to an aversive stimulus. That's kind of, whenever I see that, I'm kind of like, ah, this might be an opportunity. <laughs> So you're not contriving negative reinforcement. It's sort of, it's already existing in the environment. The animal's re responding to an aversive stimulus and you kind of go, okay, well, here it is. Here's that opportunity. Can I, can I apply it here? And my first opportunity was, was with these Somalian wild asses <laughs> and they were afraid of people. And, um, and the way that the people had been doing it is they've been just sort of, you know, walking around the animals and, you know, waving their hands and hoping that the animals would just get used to people. And of course they were sort of being even more afraid. And, and so I just tried some repetitions of it. And in one session, the animals were starting to approach me and I was negatively reinforcing approaching by walking away from these Whoa. animals. Yeah. In one session, it was probably like a 40 minute session, but I was, I was like so blown away and then I actually got to transition to offering food in the one session. And I had three out of five animals taking food for me in one session. And that, you know, blew my Whoa. mind. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, yeah, so that, you know, when we, when I was working with Nicole Dory in grad school, she was, she had a project with this little herd of llamas and um, basically we needed to get them halter trained um, because the zoo, it's at that little zoo north of Dallas and Gainesville. Frank Beth, yeah, Frank Beth. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but basically, what the staff was doing was like they'd chase them, corner them, sling, you know, sling their arm around their neck and slap the uh, harness on their face. So the llamas weren't thrilled <laughs> about that. Well, I will procedure. say now, I, I do work with them, and those guys do a lot of great training now. So to their credit. yeah, you know, that was a long, long time ago, and they've been through some management changes since then. So yeah. I don't, I'm not being critical of them at all. <laughs> um, uh, we all learn and grow, and they've had uh, things are a lot different in a lot of places in the world since 20 years ago, um, but or however long ago it's been since that happened. Um, but when we started, we offered, it was, we were at the beginning of the beginning of this cat research and we would offer the, we did the preference test and they liked um, sweet potato chunks. So we'd offer the sweet potato chunk and we'd wait for some, we were working with this one, the female llama that we had and she, she'd look and you'd, you could tell that she really wanted that thing but she really really double didn't want to be close to us so we would just drop it on the ground and walk away and basically what would end up happening is when we finished all of our sessions the llamas would come and eat all the stuff that we had left on the ground so it really wasn't helping us at all other than right. giving them another way to another thing to be ambivalent about um so um I'm glad you yeah, mentioned so, that because a lot of people talk about that, you know, the dropping the food and walking away, dropping the food and walking away. And I don't, you know, and like you said, I don't think that's helping you get to where you want to go. Yeah, I think if we would just kind of use that true power of what they already told us they need, which is distance. And it's, you know, when you think of it in the big picture, that's a, that's a survival thing for them. That's, they evolved to avoid things that are scary so that they don't get eaten or, you know, die. And um, um, so we don't want to add a little bit of that fear, like make them trust the scary lion <laughs> who's holding, you know, yams or whatever they're thinking. Um, we don't want to, it, it's, we don't want them to have to 
stress out to gain what they need. We want to, in fact, do the opposite and show them you are going to get what you need by offering me these super easy behaviors that you already know how to do. So you do not have to, if you're a dog, lunge and charge and stand on your back feet and choke yourself on a leash because you need us to go away. Instead, all you have to do is turn your head or sit or something super easy that doesn't make your blood pressure go through the roof. It's going to be a lot easier to do what I'm going to reinforce and you are going to feel a lot better. Um, you know, speaking anthropomorphically and all that, but the fact is that's, that's my goal in my heart is for them to be able to um, get what they need in, in the most accessible and easy way possible. Mm -hmm. I agree a hundred percent. We're going to take a little break to give you your first secret word. And the secret word is distance. D-I-S-T-A-N-C-E, distance. Secret words are important to remember and submit to show you have listened to this podcast for your professional development. Listening to podcasts are required for earning certain badges in the online education program, animaltrainingfundamentals.com. All right, back to the program. I kind of want to get into the pushback because oh, I've been boy. experiencing, I know it's a tough, it's a tough question, but I've been experiencing it. And I, and I know, you know, gosh, you, I mean, your thesis was back in 2007, right? Yeah. And here we are 2021 and it, it sort of feels like recently there's been a bit of a turn where people are starting to embrace it more, but it's been a lot of years where people have really, struggled with with being receptive to the whole idea yet you know I'm I'm a believer now but like I said it took me a while as well why do we think people are so hesitant what's what's the challenge well I have some thoughts on that and I you know I think part of it well how do I want to say this um um, as far as, you know, my responsibility and Jesus's responsibility in maybe presenting it wrong in the first place or presenting it less than um, gracefully early on was that we shared, um, I, I shared a lot of our research process. Um, so there were videos that were out there that were research videos. And in the videos, there were, um, there were, you know, when you work with cat, you, you work to stay under threshold, just like you would with desensitization or counter conditioning. Um, but there were videos that we showed that involved, what do you do if you go over threshold? So we would have a dog erupt and we would show what you should be doing um, in those situations. And then we'd show some clips of um, really easy errorless trials, um, but those were super boring. <laughs> and those were the majority of the trials. So people got the idea that what we did was go and force ourselves on dogs until they blew up. Um, and so there was some some misunderstanding there that they weren't they weren't seeing the whole big picture. But then the other part of it was that before I came along, the word negative reinforcement already was um, associated with evil, and you know because you're because negative reinforcement was a word a term that was used. It was even in the title of my thesis. Um, uh, people assumed that I was putting a shock collar on dogs and that kind of sort of thing. I mean, they didn't literally assume that, but they assumed it couldn't be any better because the word negative reinforcement was there. Um, and so over the year, I mean, in fact, just before we started communicating before to set this up, I had gotten reamed on Facebook not too long ago about 
about it. And it was just like, it was like still after all these years, people are still just like so much in a little box and they don't want to hear they really would not even have a discussion about it. They didn't want to hear what we were doing, why, um, you know, what might be good about it. And I'm not, I have not ever gone out into the world and said, you have to change everything you're doing and only do what I say to do. I've never done that. And I never will do that because I don't know everything. Um, but I will say, here's something I've learned and, um, so it's been painful at times because it does come down to um, it, it'll come down to personal attacks, which is never appropriate. And and when the attacks completely miss the point, it's just like frustrating. So so that's been going on since I started. I started showing the work. I think he, Susan and I did our first seminar in 2006 before I graduated. Did you go to that one? Uh, um, we did well we did one together many many years ago where yeah yours might have been the very next one because we did do that I don't remember but anyway um it's always been a mixed bag there have been people who are like I'm going to go out and try this and they go out and they have great luck and there are people from that first seminar that are that have it as a center piece of their training now um, and then there are other people who were like interested, but then they go out and they talk to other people in the community um, and they, they get, get scared off. Um, so it's, it's just, um, it's really just a political community type of thing where it's, it's more about politics than about what's really in the procedure. Well, and here's here's one of the things I wanted to share with you because I feel like this um, <clears throat> this changed the um, trajectory of my career, and and so I want to give you credit for this because I think how so? Yeah, I know you're, this is this. I really thought about this a lot because um, it it changed everything for me because you know prior to you know not using this procedure. Um, I, you know, I, I think like everybody else, I had that opinion of negative reinforcement because it's what I was taught. You know, it's what we've been Me taught. Too. That I was negative, too. Negative reinforcement's bad. It's coercive. And, um, and what, you know, and then uh, having that conversation with Jesus and saying, okay, I'm going to try and I tried it and I had success and then I continued to try it and fine tune my skills because absolutely, you know, I think people need to practice and you need to, you know, you have to have your failures. I had some, you know, I've, I've made my mistakes as well and learned, you know, what I need to fine tune and do better. And I've shared those mistakes in my presentations. And, um, and then this caused me to start questioning what is negative reinforcement? And as you were saying earlier, what about these contingencies? You know, you know, what is, what are they? And what have I been taught about them? And as you know, we've been taught some things in recent years that for me, weren't making sense, you know, like, like, you know, we have to use them in a certain sequence and that negative reinforcement is second to last. And, and I was really struggling with that. And, um, and, I, and I kept thinking, well, this doesn't make sense. You know, negative reinforcement used in this procedure, in my opinion, is really non-coercive. And, um, and why would that be the last thing I go to when this is what the animal wants? And positive reinforcement is not gonna be my first choice. And so I was really having these internal struggles trying to figure out this doesn't, what this person is saying doesn't make sense. And what I'm having occur in real life, you know, using this procedure, you know, this speaks to me versus what this person is telling me. And this person is saying about negative, you know, and all of this, I was just going, this does not make sense. And I don't believe what this person is telling me, no matter, you know, how much they're saying they speak for behavior analysis. And this, and I'm like, I, I don't believe the stories I'm being told anymore. And I said, and I said to myself, you know what? I need to go back to school. 
And I decided to go to get my, my master's in behavior analysis. And it really all comes back to this. And, and now I, I literally have started studying things and seeing things. And I now feel like I have, you know, I don't know everything, like you're saying, you know, there's so much to learn, but I finally have made contact with resources and people and more behavior analysts. And I'm starting to see, you know, what I'm calling the white lies in the name of behavior analysis. <laughs> oh my God, that's a perfect way. <laughs> because they are, I mean, these things are being presented to us in the name of behavior analysis, but they're not the truth. You know, as you were saying before, you know, we should be making function-based decisions. Um, you know, if negative yeah. reinforcement is the appropriate um, uh, function behind that behavior, then we should use a negative reinforcement-based procedure. And negative reinforcement isn't applied the same way every single time, as you, um, you know, already discussed, we don't, you know, have to, you know, choke on a choke chain is choking on a choke chain is not the same as what we're talking about here with the constructional approach. And just as we've discussed before, you know, positive reinforcement can be very coercive if you apply it wrong. Um, you know, as you're saying, we can reinforce aggressive behavior or we can deprive animals of things that they want to, you know, uh, potentiate reinforcers, which is not okay either. You know, there's lots of ways to do these, these procedures. We can use principles in ways that are inappropriate in our procedures in all sorts of ways. And so it's, it's more complex than that. And we're using our, our um, you know, everything's happening in a nonlinear way, which Joe Lang talks about all the time, which I think is really cool. You know, things are happening at the same time. You know, we might be using positive and negative reinforcement at the exact same time. They're not exactly. They're not sequential. And, and there's even the, the classical operant is always going on. All of it's it's yeah. all a tapestry. And I love that. You know, like what we were talking about prior to recording that, you know, if we don't use the appropriate intervention, we are delaying animals to what they need and we're, pro we're preventing them from getting what they need and potentially causing that behavior problem to get build up reinforcement history and get worse and worse and worse and worse. And so all these things, you know, have been coming you know, to light, to me, to light, or, you know, I'm becoming more enlightened on these things now from having the opportunity to spend the time studying and, and, you know, getting to talk yeah. to people who have this information. So I, I get to credit you for that, Kelly. So thank um, you. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's awesome. I, I, um, yeah, I mean, it's one way I look at, at this, I think, I think that people teaching these procedures, especially when they've been communicated from um, the science world to the practical world. So my first learning came from Doug Cook, the bird trainer, and Karen Pryor, the dolphin trainer. And they all got their information from applied behavior analysis and then applied it out in the world. But then there was, uh, and, and this is understandable, but what happened to an extent was that people who were teaching were looking for a, a way to make it teachable, uh, to make it easily easy to teach. So they're putting it in compartments, they're putting the four, um, you know, positive reinforcement, the four quadrants, um, we have them in these neat little boxes and they always fit in there just in these certain ways. And real life isn't exactly like that. But in as a general rule for me in training, um, I look for if what I what my goal is, do I have an animal that I want to do weave poles? You know, I, I want to teach him to do agility. He doesn't have weave poles in his repertoire yet. So I'm not, it's not a problem for me to throw in some treats to make doing the weave poles more interesting for him. So I'll use treats in a situation like that. But if this dog is um, trying to bite grandma every time she comes over, and whenever he does that, she goes into another room 
Um, I, that behavior is already there. It's in his repertoire. He's already doing it. So what I need to do is look and go, what does he get out of that? Well, he gets rid of grandma. So how do I fix it? I have grandma go away when he does better things. And then it gets to the point where, um, well, somebody usually in the audience will say, but I don't want to always have to go away. I want my dog to eventually like people. That's when we talk, we get into the, the switch over, as we call it, but it's basically they get conditioned and they kind of figure out that we get it and we become more desirable and you can do the same thing with grandma. So, <laughs> so, so giving him treats when grandma's around is um, not going to hurt anything but it's probably going to slow down the process. If you really want to get through the process and have the dog not be confused by what is expected of him and build new repertoires that fit in this environment, then use the functional reinforcer, which is with aggression and fear, it's typically distance that they want. I love it. I love it. Time for your second secret word. And the secret word is friendly. F-R-I-E-N-D-L-E-Y. Friendly. All right, let's get back to the program. So uh, we haven't talked about the fact that you actually wrote a book about this. I did write a book about this. Um, it was published in um, 2018 by Fox Chapel Subsidiary Companion House. And it's called... I'll show it to the camera but you're not the camera's not here um it's called uh turning fierce dogs friendly it's by me and it's got um it's got a lot of stuff that is um helpful in terms of learning how to do observations how to set up a procedure it's not heavy on science because the publisher wanted something that pet owners could understand as well. So what's happening is a lot of trainers are using this book as a handbook for their clients um, so that they can have, they can assign homework and that sort of thing. So I definitely encourage you to go out and buy eight or 10 copies <laughs> just to have. <laughs> good. good, a good place to get your feet wet. For those of you who are yeah, it'll give you the concept. Um, and I am giving a, uh, doing a four part uh, webinar with Behavior Vets New York City. And one of them is already happening. Another one's tomorrow, but you can buy the, um, the series and you'll get the recorded ones along with it. So if you're interested in doing that, that's an option too. Okay. We're kind of taking it through step by step and setting up training and um, and showing you what progress we make. Great, we'll put a link on the episode webpage so people can access that easily and make sure that they listen to that. And then I've also noticed that there have been like some more people that have done, like since you did your thesis, it seems like some more people have done some projects um, through UNT, have you, followed up on yeah, that? Yeah, um, um, Angie Renfro did her cat, hers on uh, fearful, feral cats. So she did the same procedure with feral cats. Um, and then Morgan Katz did the procedure with fearful shelter dogs. Um, she actually worked at the SPC of Texas when I was working there as an intern for me. So that was awesome. Um, and there were some earlier ones. Um, Melissa Moorhead did one with cattle. Um, and I think there were some others that I've forgotten. So yeah, so there's a series of research along those lines. Nice. So it's getting replicated for those who were wondering. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. It's cool. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, and I do have this question here because I, I think it's pretty it's a pretty cool thing to think about. But have you ever thought about the fact that you've brought something into animal training that's changed? It's changed our industry forever. I mean, that's it, pretty cool. Well, I hope so. I that was kind of you know you always kind of have this dream of your career doing something that's worthwhile, and I've always been um, 
you know, I've always just loved animals so much that if it could have something to do with making animals lives better, I actually thought I would work with um, parrots in, in my research. And it turned out I worked with ad aggressive dogs, but um, yeah, so it's, it's, um, it, it's kind of awesome when, I, especially when I get those emails that people um, are having success and uh, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. And I have, I have done a little bit with, you know, a couple of my birds here just to kind of demonstrate that it can be done. So I'm sure it'll, it'll have more impact in the parrot world sooner than later. So yeah, yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think, I think we covered a lot there. I'm really so, so grateful that you spent some time talking to me about this because it's been a huge impact in my life and I'm really thankful that I get to practice it with exotic animals and hopefully I'm helping some others in that community practice yeah, this procedure sure. and spread the word in that community because we definitely need it in the exotic animal training community as well. So. Yeah, we need it everywhere. It's just if we can learn these procedures that are doable and, and get them out there, it makes a big difference in the world, I think. Absolutely. You make a big difference, Kelly. Thank, thank you. you. And so do you, Barbara. Well, thank you. Well, I hope we get to see each other again someday soon. I do too. I'm way up here in Pittsburgh. So, but I, I don't plan to be stuck here now that COVID's on its way out. So. <laughs> oh, good. Well, come on back to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, all I'm right. sure everybody has all your contact info on the web uh, episode webpage and, um, and look for turning fierce dogs friendly and the webinars. Yay. All right. Yay, yay. Thank you, Barbara. Yay. You can see why it was so important to talk to Kelly. Very inspiring for me, really changed my life and is changing the lives of animals all over the world. So there you go. The constructional approach, cat, whatever you would like to call this procedure, it doesn't matter. Just get to know it. Uh, find, a, find a way to get this into your repertoire. Definitely check out Turning Fierce Dogs Friendly. Check out those webinars so that you can learn more about this procedure if you haven't been exposed to to it yet and uh, learn more about why people like me are embracing this and putting it into our repertoire. It's really important about changing animal welfare using these non-coercive approaches and understanding more about the behavior science behind this and why our different procedures using different principles can be applied differently. You don't, you don't need to put everything in a little box. <laughs> they definitely all have their place in our toolbox. So again, I hope you enjoyed this podcast and please be sure to let us know. Give us a review and uh, hopefully we'll see you here on the next one. Thanks so much for listening. If you liked what you heard today, visit AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com for more quality content on animal training. You'll find courses, community, and extensive video examples from my consulting work around the world. We'd love to have you join our force-free family.